is there's this generally sort of accepted or, or pervasive thought that 10 to 20 percent body fat for males and like 15 to 25 percent body fat for females that is like the coup de gras that's that's it and if you go above that then somehow you need to stop immediately about face you know and, and cut back down or if you go under that, you know, the, so, something, you know, as bad is going to happen to you. And I just want to say those are as useful as the strength training standard tables. Like, you know, they published, oh, in general, if you're an intermediate lifter, here are the numbers you may, you know, come across just mm -hmm. based on, that's based on experience. Um, and if you're an advanced lifter, here are the numbers you're going to have at a certain body weight. There, that doesn't mean that you're an advanced lifter. You might get that at an intermediate state. Um yeah. And so these body fat things, they all need to be taken into context of, well, what is your waist? What does the rest of your health picture look like? Uh, what, what's your normal like body fat set point? So a person like me, for instance, I'll walk around at 15 to 17% body fat all day, every day. That's like my normal, as long as I'm eating and training, you know, and not doing a, an, a, a very elevated amount of conditioning. That's just my day to day. If I want to go down to 12% or 10%, I'm going to have to to perturb my training situation and my dietary situation to make that loss of body fat occur, which is going to compromise my strength training. I mean, it's a trade-off, right? Uh, yep. And and so people are like, yeah, I just want to walk around at like 10%, bro. It's like, that's not going to happen unless you normally walk around around 10 to 12% and then, hey, you may in fact be real strong and walk around 10 to 12% and we'll all hate you. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm just so lean. I don't understand the deal is I'm just too lean. It's like first world problems, you know? Just like, yeah. but, you know, the same thing. The person who walks around at 20%, yeah, well, when they go through their novice LP, they may end up at 23 or 24% body fat. But provided their waist doesn't jump above 40 inches and, you know, their other health parameters don't go to crap, then that's an okay trade off as well. So, context. Yeah. Important. Okay moving along so what's the deal with getting stronger without your weight going up like can that even happen man <laughs> so this is something that you i feel like you get ribbed about this a lot because of your statements in the past about getting stronger uh while not gaining weight or getting stronger while losing weight or gaining muscle while losing weight and all these kind of things they get kind of conflated and it's and it reminds me a lot of the strength uh, or the the exercise physiology literature where the, a lot of times studies will look at like strength outcomes and hypertrophy outcomes and then they just kind of like get lumped together in the press release or in people's interpretation of them and so i feel like you've made it fairly clear that the amount of object of uh, absolute muscle gain that that you can necessarily small, uh, if any oh, at all, on, depending on. on the situation. Hold on, stop, stop. Can you repeat that? Which part? Just that the after I got ribbed and everything else, it just started cutting out a little bit. Oh, okay. So uh, you, got uh, the, you got through the press release. You know, they just lump those things together, and then. Yeah. So, so I'll, all right, I'll start over. <laughs> yeah. So reminds me a lot of the exercise physiology literature, which tends to look at both outcomes of strength and hypertrophy in a lot of studies. And then when people get the press release or when they look at the abstract or when they report this data on their social media feed, they tend to conflate those two outcomes and they try to lump them together. And so it's important to differentiate the two because it actually there's different implications in a lot of these studies and you yourself have talked a lot about how the amount of absolute muscle gain you can achieve in the context of a caloric deficit is very small um, but that doesn't mean that you can't get stronger in that situation or while, while you're eating at maintenance for sure is all the time who are in that I guess that class two situation who are like the 5'10", 245 person who make it through their novice linear progression and they can make a good amount of progress. They can get quite a bit stronger. And then without really putting uh, much, uh, much significant effort into their own weight loss, they spontaneously lose a little bit of weight or a little bit of body fat or their measurements improve. And so it is possible to gain strength while in either a weight loss, situ while in a weight loss situation for some, for, for, for uh, novices. But for at when you're at weight maintenance, it's definitely possible to get stronger. But as we mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, uh, there is a trade-off there. And so we are trading off 
uh, the rate of strength increase that we might be able to achieve, uh, given the context of our kind of body weight, body composition type goals, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that was said very ele elegantly and uh, quite correctly, my friend. Um, yeah, so I, it's very difficult, if not bordering on impossible, to gain lean body mass at the same time um, where you're losing fat. And in fact, almost every dietary situation produces a loss of lean body mass. The latest ratio that I've seen where things are optimized is for every pound about three quarters of it is actually body fat and 25% is actually lean body mass. But that makes some I mean, of your glycogen stores decrease. Sure. Your, uh, at the, your ash component of the lean body mass decreases that bone mass, your visceral tissue, or, the, or you lose some mass from there as well. The contents in your GI tract, I mean, water goes down. So yeah, look, things are going to change. Um, you're going to lose some lean body mass and oh, you can get stronger. The more interestingly point more interesting point here is that if your programming is trash all mm -hmm. right <laughs> and you're still cutting weight and you switch to appropriate programming you can actually get much stronger while <laughs> losing weight so people are like oh you think i can gain a lot of strength while losing weight i'm like uh yeah you're switching from five three one bro like <laughs> <laughs> yeah things can happen yeah, that's that's a that's a real important point. Is the programming needs to needs to kind of be constructed in the context of what your what your weight situation is, and uh, what are what do you think? So if I'm going to aim to cut weight, let's say I want to go to the 83 kilo weight class, Jesus. and so because I'm going to be in a weight loss situation. I know that my recovery resources are going to be limited and I'm definitely not going to be able to tolerate too much training. So I'm going to go into the gym a couple times a week, just work up to like a heavy single uh, and kind of call it a day, super high intensity, trying to maintain all my lean body mass by just, just crushing it with like an RPE nine and a half single on the squat, call it a day. What do you think the outcomes are going to be from that situation? Yeah. I mean, it's going to be very bad. Uh, <laughs> like you're, <laughs> you're going to lose a lot of lean body mass. You're going to lose a lot of strength, not only from the actual loss of, you know, functional st structural tissue, but also just due to detraining because your program's trash. Um, so my default when somebody says I'm not getting stronger, isn't that they need to gain weight unless they're grossly underweight. It's mm -hmm. that their programming is inappropriate or the way that they're executing the programming is inappropriate that's my like you know if i'm going through an algorithm it's person's not getting stronger is their programming appropriate yeah <laughs> you know or so maybe the first bubble that it would come to is are they grossly underweight if no it moves on to the next one is their programming inappropriate if yes right. fix programming if no you know go now you go down the rabbit hole like okay if their programming's appropriate like are you giving them a chance to demonstrate improved strength gain are you giving the you know uh is their motivation still high are they injured like mm -hmm. do they have a, a, a disease a systemic disease like <laughs> well no and you know we, yeah. we laugh about this but at the same time it's like i see so many people on programs that are inappropriate for them that it's just that you know common things being common programming is the issue so yeah so hey this is a good time to plug barbell medicines now <laughs> <laughs> no i mean you know you and i see it just just from a coaching perspective uh yeah we see we see it a lot even with i mean so so now we're even let's say we're getting into the post novice phase we're getting towards an intermediate lifter right and so they're gonna hop on your uh all-time favorite program three-day week vanilla textbook texas method they're going to get through the, the base program, they'll start cycling their reps or running it out or all these methods. They'll get down to the point where they're doing like three singles across for their intensity day at like 105% of their one RM and they miss their third single across. And then they're like, oh, I need to gain five pounds by next week so I can, <laughs> so I can nail this top single, which is like, it's, yeah, it's, it's an unfortunate mindset that is ultimately counterproductive in the long-term development of a trainee. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I should go like, let's just, this will be the official like nugget from my stance on the Texas method. I think that when you take Texas method as, as it's set up, squatting three days a week, pulling once a week, pressing three days a week, it's not a bad setup. I just think that there are modifications that need to be made to optimize it for somebody uh, who would be appropriate 
to implement that that would be implemented in um you know and that would generally be look if you take 90 percent of somebody's 5rm and you have them do five sets of five across at that so a 5rm is about 84 85 percent you take 10 percent off of that now you're at 75 percent hey five mm-hmm. sets of five across there might be fine for a person who can handle uh, that level of intensity if they can't you know then maybe it's 70 percent but that's not egregious the sure. my, my main issue is with intensity day so the way I view intensity day within the context of a working Texas method is that this gives you practice and develops your skill at expressing your strength. So I would much rather see, for instance, a single at, you know, uh, at 90% to 93%, which is effectively an RPE eight. And then mm-hmm. at one heavy set of five afterwards, that being your intensity day, because it gets giving you a chance to learn the skill that is to display your strength. Um, I, you know, I had a discussion with Leah about this at the gym today. Have you ever noticed you go to a powerlifting meet and you'll see somebody who's real, real strong and then their third attempt looks like it should have been their first attempt. Just, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh my gosh, look at the technique is so good. It's like, well, no, that was just submaximal. They actually didn't go to a max. Right. And then you see somebody whose second attempt flew and they, their third just, just glued, right? Mm-hmm. No chance. Well, I think that their actual strength development has been high, but their ability to take that strength development and you know harness it in to the display of a true one rm has not been developed and how do you develop that skill practice skill yeah. practice regular exposures to singles you know and that's how you got to do it and so if texas methods intensity day functions as that and then the primary driver uh, for the volume is on days one and two and you can modify those variables accordingly to the person mm-hmm. okay that's fine but I think that most people run Texas method in a way that is unproductive. And my experience has been that it requires modification, which is why I tell people that I don't like vanilla Texas method. And people try to develop this riff like, oh, you and Rip are at odds because you won't recommend his program. Well, Rip agrees with me. Yeah. Which is why he published the article. He wouldn't publish the article if he thought I was full of shit, you know? So. Anyway, if you haven't read the article that I'm discussing, it's called Into the Great Wide Open. It makes a case for why Texas Method may be suboptimal originally because it re- produces, it's a reduced amount of volume compared mm-hmm. to um, the starting strength novice progression. So if you're moving on and you know that you need more volume, likely, since that's like the highest correlated training variable to uh, improve training outcomes, then why would you go less? Yeah. Yeah, and it is interesting when people make the argument that uh, intensity rules the day, it's all intensity. You've made the very astute observation that you can infinitely scale volume, whereas you cannot do that with intensity. What do you mean by that? So this is kind of uh, getting into the discussion we've had before and we are going to continue having about this concept of volume sensitivity and intensity dependence and things like that. And so, again, we like to zoom out and think about big picture, long-term development of people uh, rather than kind of aiming for the next PR that they can hit next week uh, because that's what people like to see is long-term, long-term progress. And so there are a number of exercise programming training variables that we have to manipulate. The specific variables have been discussed at length elsewhere. The pertinent ones here being your total training volume and your training intensity, which you can take, say, as either a uh, an, an intra session or an average weekly or whatever type of metric for intensity you want to look at. And so I trust that it is not controversial that over the lifetime training career, uh, in order to continue making progress, we always talk about you need to perturb homeostasis. And to do that, you need a greater and greater degree of stress to do so. And so if you're going to induce a greater amount of stress or impart a greater dose of stress onto an individual, one of these standard programming variables needs to go up. And so uh, we typically refer to frequency, training volume, training intensity. And so which one of these, let's say you're going to start training someone, let's say I'm I'm training uh, a kid starting at age 16, and he's going to train for the rest of his life. Uh, Of course, there's going to be an inflection point or or a apex after which kind of overall performance is going to ultimately decline. But let's say I'm going to train him to the peak of his all-time strength career. Let's say he hits his all-time strength PRs at age 
38 or 40 or something like that, which can, which happens, right? Or, mm -hmm. or 50, 57, because I'm training teenage Dave Ricks or whatever, right? Teen Nation? Teen, teenage oh, Dave Ricks. Not Teen Nation. And I have to be able to continually induce greater amounts of training stress on this trainee for the next 40 years. Uh, if I'm going to increase frequency, that is going to be capped at seven days a week of training. That would be the highest I could possibly go, right? I could start doing two a days, three a days, four a days, but at that point, you see the obvious problems with their uh, ability to recover from session session, session to session. Uh, the other one would be uh, I could continually increase their intensity, and so at any given time, we have whatever their actual one RM would be, and I'm going to start bumping up their intensity higher and higher. Let's say that I have a 55 year old person who I'm worried that they're not going to be able to tolerate a whole lot of training volume. Uh, and so I'm going to start ramping up their intensity. Well, over the long term, the highest I can get that to is I'm what am I going to have them come into the gym on a given day and do three singles at 99% one RM and ex and call that a workout for them and expect them to be able to hit that. It's like unlikely that people are going to be able to do that. Uh, and then subsequently recover and come back the next week and add weight to that or two weeks later, or three weeks later, add weight to that and do three singles across at whatever their new 99% one RM is. So there's a hard upper limit to frequency, there's a hard upper limit to intensity at 100%. Training volume, in theory, can be scaled essentially infinitely. You can keep adding sets. Now, the context or the context, you know, is that we always have to couch training volume in the context of what the intensity is going to be, because you can only do so much volume at a given intensity before you die, you break something, you get injured. And so, if I'm going to keep scaling up someone's training volume, the average intensity at that point is going to start coming down. And so people get afraid of this and they say, oh, I'm not lifting heavy weights anymore. I'm not getting stronger. And that is a fallacy uh, because again, those people are not zooming out and looking at the big picture. They're looking at the weights they're lifting right now and seeing, oh, this weight is only 68% of my one RM. 68% doesn't get you any stronger, which is false. And interestingly, I was looking back at the past two training blocks that I've done ever since my quad was feeling better going all the way up into this meet. So the context being that now, of course, on my squat, for example, I'm at the absolute strongest squat I've ever had. Uh, when I squatted 600 last week, it was the fastest I've ever moved it. So that tells me the bar speed there for that uh, PR weight tells me that I'm at the strongest I've ever been. Look back at the past two training blocks that I did. So relative to a 600 pound one RM, before the last like two weeks of peaking coming into this meet, before I hit those last two weeks, the heaviest volume work that I did or sets of multiple reps that I did was right around like 480 pounds for like a set of four or something like that. So if I do the math on that real quick, that's about 80%. Over the course of these two training blocks that have taken me from detrained injury situation to the strongest I've ever been over the course of a few months was around 80% for a set of four, give or take. Uh, and so I started out literally squatting like 370 or something like that for some sets of five. I was doing like five, six sets of five and it was super light. But when you zoom out and you look at the big picture and all this stress gradually accumulated and escalated over time. So when you, you would think that you know, a lot of people, when they hit their PR, it's like, oh, you must have hit, like, if, let's say someone squatted 600, they're like, oh, what's your best gym triple? It's probably like, I don't know, 555, 560, something like that. If you've squatted 600, it's like, I've been nowhere near that for a triple over the course of this period of time. Because it's more so, instead of worrying about the absolute weights on the bar, accumulating sufficient stress over a long period of time. And then when you back off the stress, dissipate your fatigue, you know, and then you start feeling ready and the weights on the bar just end up going up. That's what I was mentioning is now everything that's heavy feels light because I've trained, adapted to increase training volumes. And now I'm realizing kind of the effects of the past few months of training. Yeah. And well, that's also, again, you have effectively transferred your strength development to skill development, which is, mm -hmm. you know, displaying. I don't care what your best triple is. Yeah. I don't care what your best set of five is. I care what your best single is. So, yeah. you know, I have, I, I know all my best sets of five. I know all my best sets of four, but in the, in the end, I don't really care what they are. I want to know what my single is. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next question. And then we have a special lightning round. Hooray. <laughs> all right. So Austin, 
I'm going to set the timer for 30 seconds. In 30 seconds, tell us how to look like you lift. So you need to eat intelligently, which we've elaborated on at length elsewhere. I won't do that in 30 seconds. You need to train with intelligent programming that is built around the concept of long-term development. And you need to do it for like 10 years and don't miss a session. And you'll end up looking like you lift. Well, you did that in 20 seconds. All right, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to do the same thing. Okay. Three, two, one. (laughs) You need to expose yourself to intelligent training, which will incorporate a significant amount of volume because volume is ultimately going to be the driver of hypertrophy. And so from a muscle mass standpoint, you need volume to drive that. You cannot rely on intensity for volume develop or for hypertrophy development. Uh, you need to eat in a way that produces regular muscle protein synthesis responses. So that's going to be a protein rich diet, likely, uh, working towards, uh, the recommendations made in to be a beast, which is an article on barbellmedicine.com. You're going to get regular amounts of sleep so you can recover and you're going to stay healthy so you can train consistently and productively for long periods of time. Um, you don't need to necessarily do bodybuilding type stuff to get bigger. Uh, you just need the volume. So bodybuilding type stuff to me just represents an adequate amount of volume with exercises that don't really make you strong. Mm-hmm. doesn't mean there's anything wrong with that, but if you want to be strong and get jacked, you just need volume. And this is going to be really important after the novice progression. But the novice progression is predicated on an adequate amount of volume. The reason why it stops working is because the amount of volume no longer causes the stress recovery adaptation uh, sort of cycle to to accrue. You would think, so this is interesting, is that if intensity was the main driver of this stuff, that the novice linear progression would start working better and better as you went higher and higher. Yeah, it turns out, turns out. Because eventually it stalls, right? That's true. Okay, lightning round. We're going to both answer these questions. If you could be any animal in the world, what animal would you be and why? Uh, I think as a kid, I always wanted to be either a cheetah or a dolphin. A cheetah? Because they were like cheetah because they're super fast. And right. then once I started swimming, I was like, oh, I like swimming. <laughs> so now you're a dolphin. Wow. <laughs> but cheetahs for cheetahs. Cheetahs are badass. All right. So if I had to be an animal, I would be an owl. And I like the owl for a handful of reasons. One, they're nocturnal. I feel like I am. Two, they get to move. They have a a high degree of freedom with their neck. So they get to see everything, which I feel like I try to see everything. And the reason Mm -hmm. why is because they have a specialized odontoid process or DENS process. The DENS is the embryological remnant of the C1 vertebral body that fuses and becomes a part of C2. Well, they have a specialized one, which allows them greater range of motion. So there's an anatomy tie-in. I'm a super nerd. Also, the owl was the main star of the Blow Pop commercial. How many licks does it take right. to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Yeah. Ask Mr. Owl. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what was the last gift you gave someone? Uh, <clears throat> I can't remember, man. Wow, you're very selfish. <laughs> I want to let you know that I'm the best gift giver. This is actually true. I, okay. I, give, I give gains. No. Um, so the last gift. Well, I mailed a bunch of records to uh, uh, Suzanne because I found there's like a, an, an exorbitant amount of record stores in Santa Cruz. So okay. I found a bunch of Chicago records and also Drake Take Care on vinyl. Nice. So I feel like she needs that. Um, prior to that, I'm really big at giving people like little journals. I do that little journal thing, like write a book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so whenever you see hashtag Fitzbo by somebody who knows me, they probably wrote it in a journal <laughs> before they posted it on Instagram. <laughs> All right. Let's see. <clears throat> what was the last thing you watched on TV and why did you choose to watch it? Uh, the last thing I watched on TV, I think was the first couple episodes of the new season of Narcos. Ooh. Yeah. Season three is great. I finished yeah. it all. We have, we have not finished it. But okay, I that won't was, spo- no spoiler alert. All right. Have you watched Westworld yet? I am nine episodes deep into Westworld. And my okay. brain is actually exploding. Good. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> yeah, I chose it because people were tr- trolling me about not watching it. Yes. All right, let's see. Um, originally, Austin, what is what did you want to be when you grow up? Um, I have a home video of me from Christmas of like 1991 saying that I'm going to grow up and be a doctor. So that's pretty much been there wow. all along. Wow. Uh, and then 
the alternative plan was uh, when I was growing up, uh, I played a bunch of sports. And so every time I played a different sport uh, growing up, I was like, I'm going to be a professional this, whatever I was at the time. So those were plans B, C, D, and E, which obviously didn't pan out. So. I wanted to be an engineer. I just wanted to draw stuff and like make stuff. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I also wanted to be around dudes a lot. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last thing. And we're going to wrap this guy up. All right. Teach me something I don't know in the next five minutes. Oh, man. What's up, Daddy? <laughs> you know how bad I am at these, these goddamn rapid fire, no prep things. Uh, you go first. Maybe it'll trigger my memory to, to teach you something. Well, there's a <laughs> type of fish called a black hamlet fish. All right. And they are, they switch genders. So it'll be like a male and a female fish just floating around. I assume it's like Finding Nemo, you know. And then uh, they reproduce, and then they'll switch. There's more. It costs more resources for the to be a female. So then they switch periodically to pass on their genes to the next generation. And if somebody <laughs> is a male for too long, they don't you know become a female. Then the other one will stop participating and cooperating. It's like a tit for tat sort of. Uh, game theory kind of going on there that is that is super bizarre well that was off the top of my head yeah that's i don't have there. off the top of my head things so uh you can I'll, I'll find something to teach you next time <laughs> <laughs> all right you heard it here first baraki's gonna teach us something next time on episode <laughs>